Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jake Dibber of the Little School of so here at uh, American School of Dubai. This is uh, one of my favorite mornings and favorite days of the year, um, honestly, because it was a chance to meet all of you, and you get a chance to meet all of us, and we're so proud of the program that we've built in the middle school here at ASD, and this is our chance to showcase that a little bit and to share with you uh, really what is a three-year journey um, throughout uh, what I think is, is one of the best middle school programs in the world. So, so thank you so much for coming. Um, our purpose this morning is to obviously do some of those introductions, give you an overview or sort of a sense conceptually where students are at um, in the middle school uh, experience, uh, introduce you to some familiar faces, hear about um, our program in sixth grade and what they can anticipate a little bit in seventh grade and eighth grade. What is it like to transition from elementary school to middle school? And uh, obviously answer some questions, some great questions that you probably have. So thank you so much again for coming this morning. By way of a few introductions, and you'll hear from these people throughout our time together this morning, I'd like to introduce our uh, associate principal, Corey Willey, um, who, is, uh, who is with us and he'll be telling you a little bit more about our program. Um, we've got two of our amazing counselors here this morning. Ms. Courtney Beck is our department chair, and Ms. Joy Silva will be the sixth grade um, counselor next year. These are what I would call transition experts, right? Because we transition kids from fifth grade into sixth grade, which is monumental, and then we're also transitioning eighth graders into ninth grade, which is also monumental. So I would like to really think about transition as a, as a key responsibility that we have in making sure that your child is well supported um, throughout, uh, throughout their time in the middle. Uh, we have some amazing folks also in our, uh, in our office that support our students daily um, and can support you as parents as well. Um, Ms. Lena and Ms. Diala in our middle school office, they're running the ship this morning while we're all over here, but don't be a stranger if you have questions lingering after this is over, um, you can come over and see us. Ms. Fina um, is here, she's waving right now. She's um, in our counseling office, and so she'll be the first point of contact if you come over um, with questions. So welcome this morning, Fina and counselors. And we have some VIPs. We, for the first time, we're having some students take over part of our presentation here this morning, and so we're really excited about having them here um, so that you can hear their voice and they can exercise their leadership, which are key components of the middle school experience. So, once again, uh, welcome, and we're really excited to, to present to you this morning. So, middle school is not easy. Okay? It shouldn't be easy. Really, this is the first time that you're hearing this message that, um, you know, we're not really trying to. Um, portray middle school as this challenge that must be overcome, but there's inherent challenges that your child will face as they're developing into early adolescence and throughout the middle school years. It is normal. It is expected, and it's our job to partner together to um, recognize the individuality um, and the identity of your young uh, of your young child and support them whenever, wherever is needed. Okay. So I put this quote up here, and I just want to uh, actually read it out loud. I know that uh, maybe in the back it might be hard to read. It's such a crucial uh, quote from a book that I'll share the, the book with you in just a minute. Some sort of essential reading, I would say, for uh, parents about to experience the middle school uh, experience. Middle school is prime time for failure, even among kids who have sailed through school up to that point. The combined stressors of puberty heightened academic expectations, and increased workload are a setup for failure. How parents, teachers, and students work together to overcome the inevitable failures predicts so much about how children will fare in high school, college, and beyond. Okay? They are learning the skills to cope. They are learning their own personal value systems. They are learning how to self advocate and learning, as we know, is not something that is automatic. It takes time and it takes practice, okay? 
So that's our mindset that we come to middle school with, is that if those of you that have multiple children recognize that one is not like the other, right? And what parenting strategies work for this child doesn't necessarily work for that child. We have 150 middle school babies in sixth grade. Okay, and so it's our job to really figure that out, and our teachers are excellent at um, determining what those um, skills and passions are and trying to nurture each and every one of them. So that book is called The Gift of Failure. It's a New York Times bestseller. Jessica Leahy was a middle school educator, a middle school leader, and a middle school parent when she wrote that book. Okay, so she, I think, came to some realizations that everything that she was preaching um, and everything that she was doing within her professional world kind of turned upside down when she had a middle school child herself. So it's a wonderful book to read about how to approach um, really what we call um, an opportunity to coach your child in middle school and not necessarily always be trying to solve everything one step in advance so that everything is nice and smooth for them. Okay? So um, it's a great book that's available on um, your Kindle on Amazon and, and anywhere. It's a, it's, a, it's a great read. One more, one more quote, if you'll indulge me. When children aren't given the space to struggle through things on their own, they don't learn to problem solve very well. They don't learn to be confident in their own abilities, and it can affect their self-esteem. The other problem with never having to struggle is that you never experience failure, and you can develop an overwhelming fear of failure and disappointing others. This is from a book called um, How to Raise an Adult. Julie Lightfoot Hames is the author. She's uh, becoming quite prolific, was the dean of students at Stanford University for 10 years, and saw kids that were coming up through middle school, through high school, into their first year of college. Again, another transition point, right? Of, out of the home and into college, and really seeing students that had illustrious resumes but in an inability to, uh, to self-regulate, and inability to cope, um, and, and again, I'll go back to the quote, this is one of the parts that I didn't highlight this time, but a, but a fear of failure. I think it's important for us to consider <coughs> what it's like for students to, to have that feeling of challenge, and to have that feeling of failure, so that they can reflect on that experience and learn to grow from it. If we're always, again, trying to set those expectations and have them constantly live up to those expectations. Don't get me wrong, expectations are very important and we need to be clear about that. But when they're just constantly finding success, that their own measures of success are quite narrow. And, and then when something tiny happens, everything falls apart. Okay? It doesn't need to be that way. Okay? And so we do a good job. We do an excellent job in the middle school of framing that for kids, modeling that for kids. Um, our teachers are, are excellent at failing and celebrating their own failures as well because they need to see that in the, in the adults that are around them, their parents, their teachers, their peers, um, just so that they can say, hey, you know, this didn't work out the way that I expected, but here's what I learned from it, and these are the skills that I can take forward so I can, again, become more independent and more independent that's really kind of the middle school concept that, um, that we really base everything on our, our academic program, our social emotional program. Um, it's, it's all there. Um, and, and I think just two last quotes to share this morning. Um, we must have trust in each other to help children emerge with an education. And kids need the space to fail, and teachers need the time and benefit of the doubt to let the failure play out in the form of learning. Okay, so it's as I said, it's never going to be easy as a parent to see your children struggling with um, a particular incident that happened in school or a project that didn't turn out the way that they wanted it to. We've got to give them, we got to give them the space. Not that we're going to throw them to the wolves and not be there to be caring and supportive. That's not the message I want you to take away from um, our talk this morning. It's how do we provide that care and support that allows them to um, grow and develop themselves and, and see that in us as well. So any chance you can get now um, with a little bit of homework for yourself and your child, begin to explore this idea of failure and what are they feeling as they're approaching the end of grade 5 and moving into grade 6 
there's going to be apprehension. So just saying, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about isn't necessarily the message. It's, you're going to be experiencing new things, and I'm going to be here to help you through that. Okay? So um, just a few points about our, our middle school program, sort of the building blocks, is really um, having your child experience a well-rounded, engaging, and relevant program. So you'll start to see um, as early as this presentation about how we're allowing students to explore the creative arts um, and explore technology and innovation in new and different ways because it's time for them to begin to look at subject material in different ways and to see what it is that they respond well to and have some new experiences as well. Um, they're surrounded by caring and attentive role models. This, I think, is probably um, the most important thing. I'm so proud of the faculty that we have in our middle school who are zeroed in. They have an incredible focus and a level of expertise in working with this demographic. And when, when, when myself and when Mr. Willie are interviewing teachers, prospective teachers that come into our school, we say, yeah, okay, subject area content. Knowing your subject area is really important. Tell us how you care and nurture for kids. Like that is number one. If we can do that, we can upskill you and whatever else you need. We need we need people that are, are going to be present for kids and able to meet with them outside of class and to be there for them. I think you'll see that maybe some of you are already experiencing that or have experienced that as a as a prior uh, middle school parent, but, but we really work on that culture of, of, of being there for your kids. Passion for learning, student agency, so we're always trying to find ways within the content area, within the academic program to say, where can kids self-direct? Where can they take parts of our, of our academic program, explore deeper, move uh, faster, um, you know, kind of construct an experience based on what is important to the teacher, but also passionate to the student. And character development and personal growth, we've talked about that all morning already, that uh, we're here to educate the whole child. Um, this is not just about getting the top score on an exam. I think we measure success in the ways that kids um, talk about themselves and talk about their experience, and these are the things that I've grown from. This time, I'd like to introduce our uh, sixth grade team leader, uh, Jason Roach, their middle school librarian, um, who's just going to uh, introduce himself and give you just a, a quick overview of kind of a, a snapshot, probably the, the hardest slide, how you encapsulate the sixth grade experience into a, a two minutes. Uh, <laughs> just to dive in advance. Please. So I'm Jason, I'm the middle school librarian as well as the grade 16 one. So I am one of um, uh, 14 grade 6 advisors. So in addition to all your, your child's core classes and um, exploring classes and elected next year, they'll, they'll also start every day in, um, in a group of 10 or 11 kids with one of the 6th grade teachers or myself. And that's a really cool home base for them. So I just came to my kids and I actually said, I'm about to go talk to 5th grade parents, what should I tell them? And one or two of them offered up something along the lines of sixth grade is awesome. And, <laughs> and then one or two offered up like very sober looks and actually they need to learn more about power school. <laughs> there actually is there actually <laughs> power school <laughs> training, you'll, you'll get a chance for that. But um, this year's sixth graders, at least in my advisory, were not, not super impressed. So so we will we will address that in the, in the coming months. Um, so I think the top two points there, Jake already addressed um, with respect to talking about failure and giving kids room to start to take on responsibility for some of their academics and their just their general choices of moving through the day and moving through the week and planning what their year looks like. We do talk about goal setting um, quite a bit through grade six. We start, we do a lot of that work in advisory and it extends into other contexts as well. So, um, you know, they're, 10 and 11 years old, for the most part, they're going to forget things. They're going to be occasionally absent-minded. Sometimes their trouble is just the opposite, actually. That they're super, super fixated on, on making sure that everything is together. Um, we see all of that in 10 and 11 year olds, just like we see all of it in ourselves. 
Um, but we do try to address organization and time management with them. They'll have a couple of organizational tools that we'll expose them to that we'll expect them to try to be consistent with, and we really um, we're, we're reasonably strict about wanting them to do some of those things in very predictable ways, both for themselves and to help their teachers help them. And then as they move into seventh and eighth grade, they have more options and more choices um, as they become you know, more used to the middle school environment and management of days. Um, and then the advisory program I mentioned, but fifth graders will see um, many of us several more times for course registration, and they'll, they've already been, I think they came up with it just last week to, for some music intros, and that was interesting as well. Um, the three key trumpet was sort of of great interest to a lot of a lot of fifth graders, which is which is awesome. Um, I sort of thought trombone would be would be a little more popular, but um, trumpet was the one. Um, so we'll see them several times, including for a sort of a more formal step up day when they come up and actually sort of tour tour the middle school, kind of like they would in advisory, and then. Um, Jake may know the exact date right now, but it doesn't really matter. But um, the day, in, in the week before, in, in the few days before we actually start day one, we will have all the sixth graders spend an afternoon on campus. New families will be here in the morning, and we'll ask all sixth graders to come in the afternoon. We'll get together in those advisory groups that I talked about and sort out some of those um, very tricky pieces like lockers um, so that they feel comfortable with those on day one and know where they're going. We'll walk around and make sure they know where their classes are so that when they actually show up for day one and know that they're going to have classes one, three, five, and seven, they understand what that means. They've got it schemed out and they can sort of get from place to place and get their lockers open and uh, know what they're going to eat for lunch and that sort of thing. Um, week Without Walls, we just, just returned. Um, some of us, I think, are still catching up with sleep, but we do. A grade six goes to Greece. Um, it's a super well-organized trip. We've been doing it for, I think, four or two years. Um, so we've had a chance to refine it every year. It integrates really well with, um, with some of the topics of study they have, social studies in ELA. Um, and you know, all the opportunities for them to be in a room with a couple of kids and plan for that and manage themselves and then day to day. Really, really, really good trip. And then we have some top ambassadors here and a variety of ways, not just student council, but a variety of other ways for even sixth graders to take on the leadership roles. So, um, so it's it's a rich experience, um, and you know, some people dive in and be involved in everything, and other kids we have to pot and nudge a little bit, so we're going to focus on doing both of those things. Yeah. I'm going to turn things over now to uh, Corey, who will tell you a little bit more about our program. He's got some students teed up to Share the presentation. Sure. So, um, and again, just to reiterate that our academic program is designed to personalize learning for students to help them uncover their passions, to give them a wide array of experiences. And the end goal of that is independence. Um, we nest that, though, in a very supportive community. So, um, as, as we talked about, um, and as you'll hear today, while students are exploring and discovering themselves and making those mistakes, we have that with a really strong counseling program. We have an adult advocate for each student in meeting groups of um, 10 or 11 to uh, discuss issues that they're grappling with and in advisory they meet every day. Um, so it's really, um, really a dynamic program that's aimed at increasing independence but also nesting it within um, a supportive and warm community. A couple of notes of both before I turn it over to students that explain their experience in, in middle school and some of the details that you'll want to be prepared for. Uh, we're going largely digital with our course description guide. So on the Go page, um, you'll find the middle school side of uh, the course description guide. You can click on that and flip through. Um, that's going to be available. Is that available already? It is. It is. It's available today, so you can read through it. There aren't a lot of choices for sixth graders because our, um, our intention is to give them a wide array experiences so that they have um, exposure to all those experiences when they get to make more impactful choices in grade 7 and 8. So it's really about um, experiencing all of those things that middle school has to offer. Um, we just got a fresh new guide with new pictures and new descriptions, so if you through it with your kids, it also gives a really good overview, so talking to you to talk through that middle school experience 
and prepare your students. A little bit about the day when we, people see this schedule, especially coming from middle school, they get, yeah, Sot's got that face right now with the big eyes. Um, but um, by the end of the first week, students really have it down, and they're like homing pigeons, and they just gravitate to their next period. Uh, I want to turn it over to Jude, who's going to explain a little bit about what a day in the life of the middle schooler is like, and how students uh, rotate through these blocks. Okay, so like Mr. Lee said, the schedule is really confusing. So it's actually really easy to understand it. So we have four classes a day that are an hour and 15 minutes long, and it will always change the rotation. But if it's like day three, you'll have block three first, or day four, you'll have block four first. And we have five minutes to get to each class. And then we have advisory for like 10 minutes every morning. And then we'll have lunch for 45 minutes. And then pursuits where we're just going to select something that we enjoy doing. Arabic, your the, the world language choice will start in space. 
your five cents, mm -hmm. and you're also giving a lot of choices. Um, you're also giving a lot of choices, so you have to choose one, but they're both really fun. And um, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. on the Arabic thing, there are certain, you probably know by now, but if you don't, you'll get information if you, um, certain passport holders are required by the ATA to take me in Arabic, that's grade six. Um, we do allow in grade seven and eight if a student, for example, wants to take Arabic and French, or Arabic and Spanish. Um, in that category, we do allow them to replace one of their elective choices with a language if they're just really passionate about languages, but in grade six, we try and keep it simple and it's just Arabic for those students. But that's, a, that's a, only a certain category of students, and you'll be made aware if your child is in that category. Um, and um, the wheel, yeah, so they basically, it's a quarter long exploratory wheel, so they get, it's basically a way to expose them to all the arts. So they'll have, and technology, they get, all of them get all of them, the order is different for every student, um, but they get to um, kind of be exposed and they're prepared to make their choices later on. I think the Explore Wheel is another one of those programs that's really great for middle schoolers. I know personally, I was never exposed to something like drama. Um, and it's something that, as an adult, I was like, oh wow, I would have used that every day when you think about public speaking or um, some of those some of those skills that we use as adults every day, communication skills, collaboration. So um, it's a way to make sure that students know what all these are, and that even if you're not naturally gravitating towards dance, you still want students to have that exposure so that they do all the per quarter. Yep. Grade six band. Um, is Sarah here? Oh, she is. Please welcome Sarah Jorleen, um, our grade six band director. Hi, everybody. Um, I teach sixth grade band, and I co-teach the sixth grade choir with Mr. Rosier. So either way, no matter what your student chooses next year, they'll see me for their music class, which is really fun. Um, in sixth grade band, they learn a musical instrument, and we have three performances per year. We just had the Pops concert yesterday, not two days ago, and they do a fall concert in November and also a spring concert, so three total performances. Um, no prior experience is required at all. If your child has had lessons on something, that's wonderful, but if they're a complete beginner, that's great as well. We have lots of students who start fresh every year. Um, our main goal is just for the students to have a lot of fun and to explore music and find something that they're passionate about. So a lot of our students, most of our students continue to 7th and 8th grade band, and most of them also stay on the same instrument that they start on in 6th grade. We're going to have fittings for our instruments next week. And you should have received an email from Mr. Arenas about that process um, recently. So just even if your student isn't sure if they want to do band or choir, going through the fittings process can be really helpful because then that can help them maybe decide, you know what, none of these are really feeling good for me. I think maybe choir is it I want to sing, um, or, or I really like the trumpet. Let me see if I can do that for sixth grade. So hopefully I'll be seeing all of you next week as well for that. Um, and then for the choir as well. Um, all of the sixth graders who join choir have class together. Ms. Rosie and I teach that class together, which means that sometimes the boys and girls sing together, and sometimes when the voice change starts to happen, we get to split, which is really great. Um, they learn to sing in harmony and combine with other group seven and eighth graders for finale numbers at concerts, which really helps them see their future in the program. So we have a lot of attention in that program as well, which is wonderful. In both band and choir, our main goal, like I said, is to help your children understand music a little bit more, appreciate it a little bit more, and find where their place can be in music. So in sixth grade, our main goal is to help them fall off of music so that they hopefully continue to study it as they go on. So the middle school experience is Lily here also can talk about choir and band. Yeah, so Lily is... Lily is band and Jude's here from choir. Oh, great. Oh, hi, dude. I didn't even see you and Ramsey here. So we also have... Uh, experienced music students from musical here, if you'd like to ask any questions. Could you guys maybe speak a little bit about your experience in the ensembles? So in sixth grade band, it's mandatory to add a new choir band. And it's kind of, there's three, um, you can either name brass, wind instruments, or percussion. Brass is basically the trumpet, trombones, wind is uh, clarinet, flute, and then percussion. And it's kind of really important in sixth grade as well as mandatory because, like Mr. Lee said, most of them stick with those instruments. But if they don't, like if they play clarinet sixth grade, they can go on to do oboe or they can go on to do saxophone in seventh and eighth grade if they want to, which gives it, like a lot of kids look forward to that too because it's kind of more fun and cool if so they want to try. And then Mr. Lee talked about the pop concert, pop concert, which is a big one for sixth grade. Because it's like, I, I think it's their favorite one because they kind of get to vote on 
pop songs or songs you heard in movies. Like this year, we did Avengers theme as one of them, and they did Back to the Future for one of the songs. So the creators love that. And then just also, there's Omnis and JFA, which are usually something in great, but if the kid chooses to continue, then they can like try to challenge them some more if they want. We're trying out for Omnis, which is an honor band in, it's like, worldwide kind of, or they can do JFA, which is <coughs> UAE, but it's also <coughs> really fun. They get to work with other kids and just push their food. Was anyone here for the Pops concert the other night? Did anyone have any sixth grade siblings? It was awesome. One thing I love about that concert is you see sixth through eighth grade and you really see the development. And also, if you <coughs> excuse me, went to the one early in the year, to be honest, these sixth graders were a little hard to listen to. <laughs> and, uh, and they really become the, the growth is just amazing. So it's one of those things that's great as you know, as a, a leader in the school to kind of see wow, this is the end product of what all this hard work and the concert is and students and teachers working together to produce those results. So it was it's really cool.
Um, whenever you're learning more about a part of the language, that motivation, interest, and, and really wanting to be there makes a huge impact in their performance. Okay, so thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for sharing this, this, this uh, at this point in the presentation. This is probably a bit more detailed than uh, than you might need at this time, but there's always a few burning questions about our world language program, and I'd like to just spend a minute looking at the scope, not just the choice um, or experience that they'll have in sixth grade, but how that then graduates into seventh grade, eighth grade, and beyond. So there's always kind of this question about is this a three-year language program? And so I want to just take a minute to actually um, direct you after this presentation to look at that course description guide. This progression chart is um, in that guide uh, this morning, so you can take a look at this and, and study what your child's experience would be if they took this language, if they took that language. And so I, I realize that people at the back, it might be difficult to see this. I'm just going to do a very uh, brief um, overview of that. And then, of course, at the end of today's presentation, you can come and see any one of our counselors, Mr. Willie, myself, um, students. I don't know if you guys are going to stick around or if you're going to be wanting to get back to class. But anybody here is, is really able to speak to their own experience. So. Um, this chart in the back of the book does describe what happens uh, from our Arabic program in fifth grade into sixth grade. So if your child is a continuing in Arabic, native students will move into native level one. It's a, it's, it's a different program that starts at level one in sixth grade. And if they're in, in uh, Arabic as a world language currently, um, and they are choosing to continue on with Arabic, they will move into um, Arabic as a world language level one in, in sixth grade. Potentially there might be one or two students based on their proficiency level that might move into world uh, language two, but um, really our benchmark is to begin the program at, at AWL one in middle school. Then they will progress. This is the sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade that will move from native one or world one to world language two, world language three. And then, uh, thinking about French and Spanish, if your child is, is taking French or Spanish, the progression is really the same. This answers the, you know, how many years is the, is the world language program in sixth grade. For example, let's say your child takes Spanish in sixth grade next year. They will start in Spanish level one. Then in seventh grade, they will take Spanish level two. And in eighth grade, they will take Spanish level three. When they move then into high school, they move into the high school world language program at the high school course level three um, as a ninth grade student. Our benchmark or our, our graduation expectations, if you're already thinking about um, requirements for your child to graduate ASD, is really looking at a proficiency level four in high school. So if they start in sixth grade and move through, they will hit level four. Uh, potentially as a 10th grader. Um, if they start a world language program as in uh, level one at seventh grade, by ninth grade they'll move into high school level two. If they start with a world language in level one as an eighth grader, they will move into high school level two. Again, there's proficiency assessments that will help make that placement um, unique um, to kind of target that exact spot where your child will be equally supported and challenged. Um, however, that's really the, the progression. Uh, to the next one. I'm not going to go into this, but I just wanted to make you aware this is the high school world language pro progression that's also available in the course book, which does allow students to make it to uh, AP language um, or, or a level six, potentially, even as a 12th grader, if they're particularly passionate about their language. Oh yeah, so then there's one more uh, change, and, and uh, um, it was announced a little bit earlier on uh, for, for returning middle school parents. We are making a change to our math program next year. Every student um, will take math six. Every student um, a year from now will take math seven, which is benchmarked at three algebra level. 
And then for the following school year, 2021, we'll move to Mathematics 8, which is an Algebra 1 level benchmark course. Okay? So historically, at the end of sixth grade, kids have, um, have been placed in a seventh grade level, um, all students for next year, who are current sixth graders, will move into math in seventh grade together. That was one of the we're excited about that. So in terms of, excuse me, in terms of what you're going to see <coughs> in, uh, immediately when it, uh, or in the coming weeks uh, when your child brings things home and you're asked to do things for course registration, you're going to see a form that has these tables on it. Uh, most of them are not choices in grade six because the, um, the, the philosophy is exploratory. You want to give them lots of different experiences so that they can make those choices later on. But the core class is in the explore wheel, as we mentioned. There's no choice required. It's just kind of a... Here's what you're taking, FYI. Um, for grade, and this is in the, um, is this for, this form will come home from your grade five, your child's five, grade five classroom teacher after we have the student. Well, will email it to you. Yeah, they'll email it to you this one. So, um, and uh, they will make that music choice that Mr. Ronin spoke about, um, and then the world language choice. So those are the only two choices they have to make at this point. So um, that's something you'll fill out. Um, there'll be instructions in that email with your child. And then the child will bring that back to their teacher. And then the counselors come in. And we come in um, in about a month's time. And we help them register on Power School. So they do their own scheduling on Power School with the form that you completed with them at home. Um, these forms are due um, by March 21st. So you should be receiving them um, this week. Um, and so March 21st, obviously, before is better. Um, so bring those back, and then that's the guide that we use when we guide students through the course registration process. One quick thing before we uh, turn over um, back to Jake. Um, we talked about our advisory program a little bit, and it's such a, um, we call it kind of a part of the middle school. Um, I have a few students here who want to walk you through our advisory program, and then we're going to do one activity as, as your students will be welcome to the middle school with some community building activities through advisory. We also wanted to welcome you to the middle school building activity as well. So I want to invite Ryan, Cole, and Colton up to the front to talk a little bit about our advisory program. We met with uh, Falcon Ambassadors a few, um, a few days ago to see if we'd like to speak. I asked them, you know, who, who has had a really great advisory experience, who has a really strong advisory, and everyone raised their hand. So uh, but I, I picked these guys out to speak, uh, speak about the program. So Ryan's going to talk a little bit about the program in general. Um, so advisory is where a small group of students around the 10th to 11th uh, kids meet with a teacher every day of the week. Um, they usually, I mean, there's not really like a plan in the morning. You can usually just like talk or organize yourself, but they're just relaxed. Um, so. On Sunday and Thursday, you do it after lunch as well for 45 minutes. And there you usually have an advisory plan that, that, that you follow. And then after, if you're done with it early, you can just do other stuff. Yeah, and then pursuits? Um, so we pursuits. talked a little bit about pursuits, but do you want to share maybe a few of the pursuits that you um, Rock climbing. We <laughs> like rock climbing, uh, chess club, uh, boys basketball. It's a wide variety, really. Great. Um, advisory is a lot about, there's basically three outcomes we look for in advisory. Um, one is that we build a positive and inclusive community. One is that we promote self-awareness and growth. It's so important for our own school program, as we discussed. And one is that we have fun together. Uh, so we try to make it light. It's definitely not, we don't view it as a curricular class with assessments and things like that, but we also don't view it as recess, right? So it's somewhere in between. And one great that piece of data we got back from our counselors because they meet at the end of each year with the um, students doing course registrations is when we ask students, we ask all of our students in the middle school a couple, in a couple different ways. Do you have a trusted adult that you can go to if you have a personal problem? Um, and when we ask students that question, I think it was something like 60 or 70 percent? <laughs> 70 or 80 percent of them cite their advisor as one of their trusted adults. So that's great data for us. Uh, let's try it. So uh, I'm going to now to turn over to Colin Colton. It's the Colin Colton Show. They're going to walk you through one of our team building activities that we do towards the beginning of the year to maybe build some community with this group. Okay. So in advisory, one of the great things about having a small group of people is that you can get to know each other in the community. You know, people can 
trust. So, especially during the beginning of the year when you're still transitioning, it's nice to have that small group at your home base where you can touch down after lunch and just and have people who are going through the same B and D so you know you're not the only one. <laughs> So we're going to play a little game called Just Like Me. You're going to see several characteristics, things you like to do on the board. If you share a characteristic, please stand and move. Uh, so they were commonalities you share. <laughs> so uh, stand up if you love the beach. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning, it is still morning. Uh, I am Courtney Beck, and I am the current seventh grade counselor, I'm also the department chair for our uh, counseling team. I will be moving up with the seventh graders, to the seventh graders here, um, to grade eight next year, and I'm really, really excited to do that. Um, this is my fifth year in Dubai. I started in the elementary school, so I see a lot of familiar faces, but um, the opportunity arose, and I was able to join the fabulous middle school team as a counselor. Um, I've been working in some capacity in education for about 10 years, about. Um, and yeah, as, as my colleagues shared, I, it's, it's a true passion of mine, um, especially this age group. Um, I am joined here by my husband, who is high school dean of students, Mr. Beck, and my daughter, who is almost two. She'll be two in June. Um, we have one more amazing person that works in our department. Uh, her quadruplets, and you can tell the difference because I wear my glasses. <laughs>
So it's not just course registration when we talk about student goals. That's throughout the year. We're talking about lifelong learning, and it doesn't just pertain to academics and to math and English, but also learning about who you are as a person emotionally, socially, and behaviorally, and setting those goals for students. Response of services. I think I kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, we are helping support students who are coming to us. Sometimes they're emailing, sometimes they're grabbing you in the hallway, sometimes it's teachers um, reaching out to us by email or via our meetings, our weekly team meetings, that maybe we need to help support a student and or a family for a wide range um, of, of services. It could be academic, it could be something personal, social. Um, a lot of our, our work centers around relationships and students interacting with each other. That's a wide, I don't know the percentage on that, but it's a wide, um, a large number of the work that we have with our students is about relationship and how do they, um, how do they interact in a friendly way and or maintain and develop friendships or relationships or connections. And what does that look like? When you're changing, your friends are changing. It's like, oh, I thought you didn't do you, you were like mates. And they're like, no, that was last week. <laughs> <laughs> so they are changing, and we have to keep up with it, right? So responsive services in the sense of the word. Community referrals, um, I think that touched on that already as well. We're short-term focus. I mean, we look for solutions when students are coming to us and the families. How can we start to support your young ones to be able to sit in the classroom, get access and receive instruction perform at the best of their capabilities, learn social, personal, emotional skills, go and practice them in the love that we offer in the middle school. And then you have to reiterate the same things that we are supporting their young ones with. And when that support goes beyond what we can do here at school, then we need to reach out to additional supports to help us and we stay connected with those supports. Um, any questions? Crickets. <laughs> you have a question opportunity at the end. I'll pass it on to you instead. Hi again. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about what differences you might see, not just in the counseling program, but um, from elementary to middle school as a whole. Um, so first, the, the teaching for the counseling is different, as we've already discussed, that a lot of this is going to be a little bit of a review. But we go into health classes. Right now it's about twice a year, but we also push our lessons through advisories. Um, so I just got done with the first set of my health classes, um, and we were talking about relationships. Um, so it does look a little bit different than what your students are experiencing now, where their counselor goes in weekly. Um, the schedule, it looks very different. Um, there is a bell in, in the middle school, so they will have that to kind of give them a heads up as an indicator of when to be moving and when you need to be in your class, in your classroom. Um, advisory we spoke about, so they won't have one teacher, they will have eight, um, and an advisor as well. And that advisor may also be one of their teachers uh, in the classroom. Um, friendships. Friendships, as Ms. Knox was kind of speaking to, they change rapidly, and it's a lot to keep up with, and most of the time I can't keep up with it. <laughs> um, she said that, she said that, uh, the whole reference to being friends with them last week, and Ms. Lola and I were saying, I don't know, like an hour ago, <laughs> we were friends, but we're not friends anymore. But, um, so in that capacity, friendships are changing just because of where they are developmentally. Ms. Lola's going to talk a little bit more about what you can expect developmentally. Some of you might already be seeing it, um, but you'll get into the thick of it into the middle school years. Parental involvement will be a little bit different. You're going to continue to partner with the school, um, but we really do encourage self, uh, student advocacy. So rather than you going to the teacher or you going to admin to talk about something, we encourage the students to do that. This is their time to really have that independence and learn what it means to communicate with somebody, how to write an email. Um, that doesn't mean you guys no longer have a role, but it's more of a coaching role rather than a, I'm going to go for you role. Um, so those are kind of the main points. Ms. Lopez going to... Oh, homework. Homework. Home learning. <laughs> Home learning. 
Um, in elementary school, they're not seeing that. So in middle school, they will. Uh, <laughs> we do have a policy around it where they should not be um, having more than an hour of homework um, per night. <laughs> so I'm used to it, it's just this year. So per night. And we really do take care and concern into that. Um, much of what they'll see is the independent reading or projects or work that they didn't finish in class. But the teachers really do try to accommodate so they're not spending hours and hours and hours outside of school um, on the homework. what we as a school do, what teachers do, what counselors do, uh, what administrators do. But today I wanted to just mention a little bit about what you can do as parents to support your, your children through the process of, of middle school and adolescence. Can I just see a show of hands quickly? Who's already had someone go through middle school? I just want to see the professionals in the room. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. How many of you, it's your first time, oh my gosh, this is so exciting, first time in middle school. Awesome. Okay, so the majority of you will be experiencing this with your child for the first time. That's awesome. I love that. Um, puberty, puberty is going to take center stage. And so when we think about adolescents, we know that where they are in their development really determines how they learn. And if they're open to learning a certain skill, everybody's kind of at their own pace. And so we look at that individually for each student. And the grade 16 is awesome at identifying where students are, and we meet them where they are. We're not meeting them just because, well, you're a sixth grader, so we expect you to be able to do these things. All of a sudden, you're in middle school, and overnight, you woke up, and you can manage homework, and your time, and all of these, these factors. We, we don't expect that. We know that each student is going to be at their own place in the developmental process. So you might see a regression in basic skills for your child, and that's because the frontal lobe it's really developing, it's still developing, and it will until they're approximately in their mid-20s. And so, with all this added information, managing eight different teachers, and homework, and sports, and activities, you might see regression in certain skill sets, like their organization, uh, their time management. All of those executive functioning type skills, we work with those in middle school. We know that that is some of the challenges that they face, and put supports in place. They might seem clueless at times. There might be times where they're very logical and they're on the ball, and, and other times, like Ms. Knox said, they're like, huh, what day is it? What class do I have today? That's totally normal. It's totally normal. Just go with the flow and be in a position of support, like Ms. Knox said. Uh, so what, what can you do as parents? Provide coaching and support in organizational skills. This is probably one of the biggest challenges that kids self-identify when we meet with them, is that they struggle with organization. They want support. They want help to stay organized and, and manage what's going on in their day-to-day -day lives. Building memory cues into the daily routines, you want to take um, those decision-making skills that they have to make on a regular basis. And that, that frontal lobe that's still developing where all those executive functioning skills are, are actually happening, you want to put them in a different place of the brain, and habits and routines actually do that. So, for example, getting their backpack prepared the night before for the next day. Getting them into that habit and routine of doing that can help build that executive functioning skill. That's just one example. <clears throat> Helping them set reminders on calendars or task managers. They're going to be using, I believe Mr. Roach talked about an organizational tool. Do they start with the Kitab? Is yeah. that still the plan? Yeah. So they'll start with a book that they might be using or familiar with from grade 5, and that's called the Kitab. So it's something that they write in on a daily basis, and teachers check it, parents can check it and review it. There's other supports in place as well online, like Power School and, and Power School Learning. But helping them do that in a support role. You're not doing it for them, you're in a support role. Helping them foster sound decision making, thinking through pros and cons of different situations, considering other viewpoints. They're very concrete in their thinking, and they're moving through adolescence to become more abstract thinkers, where they're understanding that people have different points of view. And that's okay. It's okay that not everybody thinks the same way that I do. That's what makes us all so great. Um, so helping them get through those decision-making processes with different situations is really helpful. This is a big one, and we see this often um, where challenges and issues will start outside of school in online interactions, and they transfer into the school setting. So helping, helping them model and discuss healthy relationships, not just those face-to-face -face relationships that they're going to be dealing with, but the ones that they have online. And I'm talking about WhatsApp groups, and I'm talking
talking about um, emails even, just talking it through with them, having those conversations, what looks healthy and what looks unhealthy in a friendship or in a relationship. Those are things that you can definitely do with your child now and in middle school um, to support them. So we have some homework for you. I know Mr. Tibbert shared two books already. We're going to share three more books. <laughs> so you guys have homework between now and the start of school. Awesome books. I'm pretty sure that elementary school taught about this book often. The whole brain child. Yes. But we have two other books we wanted to share with you specifically related to adolescent, adolescent development, adolescent <coughs> relationships. Awesome books. This book, Brainstorm and Fighting and Siegel, which also he also was one of the writers of the whole range of. We also have The Teenage Brain um, by Francis Jensen, another great book to understanding what's happening in the brain during this time and how it impacts behavior and emotion regulation, decision making, all of those things. Excellent resources for you. We've reviewed the timeline. Today's the parent talk. Thursday is the talk we're going to give to the students. Thursday, March 24th. You can turn this form in early. The kids can turn it in early to the homeroom teachers because on Monday, March 25th, like Mr. Willie had said, all of us will be in the homerooms helping them register on PowerSchool. And we're going to help them register exactly what's on their form. They're going to put it into PowerSchool. They'll log in, they'll do all that work. And then they'll be registered for courses. <laughs> We've already said this, please allow your child to make the decision. Um, Ms. Geraldo really said this earlier regarding world language. They are the one taking the course. Um, please allow them to choose with your support and guidance. That's all I'm going to say about that. It's really appropriate for them to start selecting their own courses. Okay. Um, we're wrapping up now. So frequently asked questions, what happens next? We'll do the course registration with them. We do a lot of transition stuff between now and the beginning of the school year. Um, with the elementary school, I'll be coming into homerooms with Mr. Mulligan during his, his lessons and talking with the kids a little bit more. We put out schedules right before the start of school. We actually work on registration and course registration between now and through summer and into the beginning of the school year. So they'll be getting their schedules prior to orientation that they have with the grade 16 on that day before school. We usually send it out a couple of days ahead of time um, through the email. What if a change needs to be made? We really don't, I mean, we, we don't make many changes because we spend so much time making sure that the schedules are correct. If there is an error, we can do it before class starts. We do have open office hours to discuss errors. For example, if they have two math classes, that would be an error. Um, but you would just communicate that with us. But it's not often that a change needs to be made before the start of school. If you're moving, please go through the process. It's still a good process to go through, go through where they're thinking about courses that they're taking. Um, I know it's hard because you're thinking about where you're going to be next. But oftentimes, the program that you're going to be entering is very similar to, the, to our program all over the world, where they're taking the same kind of courses and, and having the same conversation that they're missing at the school that they'd be going to. So we still ask for you to go through the entire process. Any questions need to be directed to our office, the MS Counseling Office. It's our registration, it's not elementary school's registration, so we wouldn't expect them to speak to it. Um, so please direct any questions to our office, and we're happy to help you through the process and answer them. And I think now we're going to take some questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, counselors, and thank you to the students and everybody <laughs> that participated in today's presentation. I realize we have gone a few minutes over, so um, I, I'd first like to thank everybody for coming, for continuing to support um, ASD um, and, and coming out this morning. Um, this is not the only time that we'll talk to you uh, before the start of the year, uh, but I know that there are people that probably have some questions. Here's what I'd like to do, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'm gonna take a, a two minute break right now for anybody that wants to or needs to uh, take off and uh, attend to uh, probably what is a very busy day for yourself. But it is important for us to field questions and to talk through anything that you might have burning or you just want to talk through further. If you're going to stay, just come on up to the front and we'll just have a little uh, a, a chat. But everybody else, I just wanted to thanks so much for coming out this morning. So thank you so much.